years, I have a feeling I should stop while I'm ahead, but I won't. Perhaps I should mention it, but I, perhaps you also add that when I was named the inaugural uh, professor at Columbia Journalism School, and uh, for the David Lavendall Chair, uh, Liz was my indispensable adjunct professor. And furthermore, she is currently editing my biography of Malcolm X whenever I'm able to get a few chapters to her to edit. President Bacaro, fellow inductees, press club board members, staff, friends, and fellow workers. I'm deeply honored to have been selected for the 2016 Long Island Journalism Hall of Fame, especially to go in with Marie Colvin, who paid the ultimate price to the war correspondent. Whenever I ponder the death of such brave reporters as Mrs. Colvin, Michael DeCeo, Anthony Shadid, and others, I'm reminded of just how close we came to losing two of Newsday's reporters during the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2013. And I was the editor who made the decision to allow them to grant their request that they should remain in Iraq even after President Bush had ordered all Americans, including journalists, to leave the country. Matt McAllister and Moises Salman were arrested by Saddam Hussein's secret police, the dreaded Mokhaba Rock. They were held in Abu Ghraib prison, and the killing had started. And we went into an eight-day, around-the-clock, I don't think I slept hardly at all for eight days, trying to get them out. Luckily, after struggling long distance for eight days, we were able to get them released and it was one of my happiest days at Newsday. The Newsday headline the next day after they had crossed into Syria met uh, McAllister and Moises Salman. The Newsday headline quoted McAllister. He said, quote, we thought we would be killed at any moment. Now we, and just think about having given the decision, we almost lost these two young men. They were in their 20s. And it's funny how the news business work. works. <laughs> I just got a note today, as I say in the radio business, this just in. And it's from McAllister. Matt McAllister is now the uh, a bureau chief in London for Time Magazine. And he sent me this note today. He said, Moises Salman, who was his photographer, and they both were for eight days in that was great. He says, Moises, Moises Salman, the kid photographer news they sent to Jerusalem to work with me in 2001, is getting married on Saturday in Spain. Moises is marrying Kale, C-L-E, a truly wonderful and beautiful young woman. Kale is Kurdish. They met in the Middle East and will be having another ceremony in Kurdistan. My six-year-old son, Harry, will be bringing them their rings on Saturday. So there's joy in journalism. It's relieved by moments of terror. This evening, the four of us inductees are joining a distinguished group that includes Dennis Bell, whom I knew well, the legendary Bob Green, who pioneered investigative team reporting at Newsday, and Ed Lowe, who from the early days, our early days at Newsday, Ed was my very best buddy at Newsday through all those years. In addition to a feature announcement on WNBC Channel 4. I was surprised that they did this, but they did, that I was being inducted into the Long Island Press Club, but I said, okay, I'll, I'll answer whatever questions. <laughs> and in addition to those, I got an uh, email from one of your former presidents, who is Chris Cook, who is a very connoisseur, connoisseur of wine nowadays. And collectively, as Liz hinted, I began to wonder uh, if, people were responding so 
broadly because they were shocked and surprised that such a thing could happen. And I said, well, they probably didn't notify the Nassau County Police that I was being abducted. <laughs> Brooklyn College Professor Paul Moses, who was my city editor in New York, had an interesting spin on his email. Paul's email, tracking a little bit of what Liz said, said, quote, as the Bible tells us, Paul is a devout uh, Catholic, actually, quote, as the Bible tells us that the hardest honor for a prophet to achieve is his own hometown. Congratulations, unquote. Now, I'm not much of a prophet, but I do consider Long Island home. I spent my entire journalism career here, and my wife, Violet, who's present, she's over there, by the way, stand by. And I have a stand always, I have my family stand, because if you want to boo, you'll know, okay, boo on this side. <laughs> but, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, Vi and I, we raised our children uh, in Greenlaw, in Huntington. From the time we first came to the Newsday, we were still in the same house. Uh, in fact, we bought our house from uh, the parents of Mariah Carey. She was six months old, couldn't sing a lick. <laughs> All she did was cry. <laughs> it's not cool. Anyway, I accept this induction along with my wife of 50 years, by the way. We don't tell everyone that, but since we're being inducted, the whole thing, I think I see it. 50 years. Uh, and not only has she held it all together, but in many, many cases, she made it happen, including the college. Many a times, I would say, that this is too much. I'm going to have to give up the college. She said, don't dare. Give up some of those other jobs. <laughs> so, uh, and as Liz mentioned, Soweto, just think about it. I remember when Hector Peterson, the 13-year-old who was shot down, I saw it on CNN, and I was just touched. What kind of people are these who would shoot down school kids running away from them in the back? And uh, so I raised my hand and said I wanted to go. And many wives would say, are you nuts? We have three small children at that point. So Vi has not only been supportive, but she has been insistent that we try to make the world a little bit better. And to the degree that journalism could do it, she said, okay, you do your part. She had her own career. Uh, she's at Stony Brook now with some other people who were here in the house. That's probably enough I don't know the runaway. President Vaccaro asked me to say a few words about my careers, so I'd like to cite a few anecdotes that hopefully will serve as teaching points for some of the younger journalists here. First, let me say straight away that I would not have been allowed to achieve my 38-year career as a reporter, editor, manager, columnist at any other newspaper in America. There's no doubt about it. No other newspaper would allow me to have done what I have been fortunate enough to do. And I must say that no other newspaper executive but Dave Laventhal would have allowed my particular career to unfold even at Newsday. Now much has been made about the relationship between Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey, the Brooklyn Dodgers executive that brought this first black player into the major league. I was not the first African American in Newsday, but Dave's influence on my dual career as a professional as well as an agitator for racial fairness was similar to that of Branch Rickey's on Robinson and in some ways much more humane. Now, granted, journalism is not baseball. However, Dave was ultimately responsible for every good Newsday thing that came my way. David Allen Bowles was responsible for every good Newsday management thing that came my way. As my first real editor, Laventhal was keenly attuned to the future of the craft of journalism. The industry could certainly use his visionary type of manager these days, I would think. Don't you agree? Most significantly, he kept a sharp eye out not only for developing young talent, but also involving it in the decision-making process. Some people claim to develop it, but they don't involve it in the decision. We make all the decisions, you just do what you're told. Journalism doesn't change, that's not the way it should work. Dave was the type of editor who not only brought in young talent, recognized it, but he allowed them early on to be involved in the, 
in the, in the decision. One of the reasons I think the newspaper business got so far behind is because the baby boomers didn't catch on soon enough to uh, the technology of the internet. They hoped it would go away like the hula hoop. <laughs> and they got behind and they didn't know how to make it. But if they had involved the younger people, I think they, they would have been in a much better position. Dave was that way. During my very first year at Newsday, for example, Dave allowed rookie reporters to, and this was unheard of, he allowed rookie reporters to publish within the Saturday Newsday an experimental underground journal named after Long Island historian Morton Pennypacker. Jim Clorfeld and Howard Schneider, Howard is here, Jim and uh, Clorfeld are both at Stony Brook now. I mean, Howard has run the program out there. But Jim and Howard Schneider, who were both rookies themselves, were allowed to dispatch fellow young reporters about the East End searching for quirky stories. And Editor Labrador allowed them to publish his summer journal totally without interference. The experienced veteran news editors at the paper were outraged that this would be allowed to happen, but Dave extended it for two complete summers anyway. I make the decisions here, he said. He's a tough guy, and a lot of people underestimated him. The teaching point here for the youngsters is be innovative. On my summer journal assignment, as Liz had mentioned, uh, for, with Howie and uh, Jim Clerfeld, who were the editors, uh, I went undercover for a week as a live-in migrant worker at a potato farm in Riverhead. I went out in a t-shirt and jeans, said my name was Bubba, told him I needed a job. And uh, after escaping, and I should say, by the way, that my wife and uh, our young daughter, and our daughter is here, uh, I had asked them because I knew it was going to be dangerous, even though Riverhead is 40 miles away from where we live, still I figured if they found me out, I didn't want them knocking on my door. And so I said, uh, I said, uh, I asked first my wife and to take our young daughter to Hartford, Connecticut with my parents. That's the only time I think she said, are you kidding me? <laughs> I guess she didn't like Hartford. Huh? <laughs> but anyway, she went. And uh, luckily she did, but I won't get into that. So the point I would make, the Labithol, by the way, uh, I, I wrote a 4,500 word piece from the long old look perspective totally of the black migrant farm. And one of the things that had astounded me is that news had done a lot of stories on the migrants. They talked to the Vista workers, they talked to the farm owners, they talked to everybody, but they hadn't talked to the migrant workers. So, man, I, they said, well, you know, they don't talk a lot. You know, they have a private farm, they don't allow you on the farm. They can't hold their uh, germ phrase together, you know, infinities fall apart, you know. Yeah. I talked to them. So, I found out that the owners wouldn't allow you to go. So I only did that story because that's the only way I could get to them. And I figured that it was important for us to know that. Anyway, but I wrote the piece and I got a nice editor's note. I had been at Newsday less than a year at that point, by the way. So Lamethol uh, wrote me a nice note and he gave me a $500 bonus check that went toward the mortgage and a tricycle for our daughter, Tammy, who was here. I don't know what she did the tricycle. <laughs> I was only making $160 a week, by the way, before taxes. I didn't say they paid well. <laughs> the point of the migrant story, in terms of the teaching point, is dare to take risks. Now, I probably went too far taking risks in my career. If a story didn't hold an element of danger, it didn't interest me. Now, maybe some shrink someday can tell me why, but it is a fact nonetheless. Consequently, I have been run out of six countries, three of them at gunpoint. On the stretch of that gutly, gutsy underground migrant camp performance, and despite my mere two years of experience, Bob Green selected me for his investigative heroin trail team that won that 1974 Pulitzer Prize. We went abroad for seven months and traced the flow of heroin from the poppy fields of Turkey through the French Connection and essentially into the veins of drug addicts on Long Island. Now in 1972, 47 mostly young whites died from heroin-related causes on Long Island. This is 1972. The heroin scourge is back. 
No. Covering the epidemic is expensive and it can be dangerous. Someone's got to do it. Several times back then, Lavithal had to pull the pub had to keep the publisher from pulling the plug on the project. In addition to being a risk taker, Dave's diamond hard journalism was grounded upon a vigorous intellect. And this was rare for the craft of that day. Newspaper editors back then prided themselves in not being scholars. They had nothing in their heads, as one wag said. And the absolute power to express it. Not so with Dave. During the early editing process, for instance, of our heroin trafficking story, Bob Green, who was a team leader, who is in the Hall of Fame here, and is legendary, and is at Hoff, had, had his young friend at Hofstra as well. But Bob Green handed Dave a long, dense section of what became a 31-day Newsday investigative series. 31 consecutive days that series ran. I don't think anyone read it except the editors and the, and the reporters. But anyway, Bob handed Green this long uh, piece and never one to allow syntax to get in the way of a fact or a mobster's nickname. Green's prose sometimes suggested what H.L. Mencken said about the writing of President Warren Gamaliel Hardy. Bleary-eyed after get editing Green's raw first draft, Dave threw up his hands and suggested for the sake of Newsday readers that Bob should smooth out the writing. You might, Dave told Bob, adapt something of the long form style of John Dos Passos. Green nodded in agreement. It was late at night. He got back to the office and I was there still writing. When he returned, he yelled, who the fuck is Dos Passos? <laughs> Bob spent his spare time reading Nick Carter detective stories. Now, to his credit, Bob did read a copy of Dos Passos' USA Today, which I slipped to him, you know, after that night. And he read it the next weekend, by the way. And later on, uh, Don Force, who was another editor, was editing some of our copy that Green had written on parts of the heroin trail. And he was kind of perplexed, and he said, you know, I've been reading this. He said, but what is going on? So I said, ah, don't worry, Don. That's Bob doing Dos Passos. <laughs> As alluded to earlier, Dave Lamethal was a visionary leader with big ideas, and he kept a sharp eye out for where journalism was headed. As an editor, I always tried to model myself after that sense of trying to look out, in addition to covering stories, try to find out where, determine where journalism is headed. That said, though, each generation of journalists, in my view, must step up and seize the reins of the craft and set its own course. Each journal generation must set its own course. Don't just inherit it what you know, the generation before you passes along. Now, when Bill Moyers arrived as publisher of Newsday in 1967, he said that the sitting room at Newsday was like a western rodeo. Now, Moyers was from Texas, so he would know. He said, but instead of the bulls and the horses, it was the editors who were the beast. <laughs> Two years later, when I arrived, the veteran Newsday editors were indeed holding gunfights in the streets, as Tony Marrow once noted. Corruption and male chauvinism were rampant, and acute alcoholism in the city room passed as social drinking. The life expectancy of newspaper men, according to actuarial tables, and you can look it up, look it up and I did was about 45 years. Uh, alcohol and cigarettes took its toll. And many of them passed on with acute respiratory and circulatory ailments. Now, Bill Moyers, Laventhal, Thomas Winship, Woodward and Bernstein, and others of my generation managed to tame that Wild West journalism they inherited. In closing, at least I leave the impression that my relationship with Laventhal was key mainly 
on diversity issues. Let me emphasize that in addition to protecting my weekly column, Dave entrusted me with running Newsday's national desk, state, the Washington Bureau, the foreign desk, the health and science operation, and finally was serving as editor of New York Newsday. And of the 14 Pulitzer Prizes that Newsday won during the Lattenfall era, I was directly involved in seven of them, either as a reporter or editor. Whenever I left it across the country, I'm inevitably asked how I survived for 38 years at Newsday, given my agitation for racial fairness and my provocative weekly column. Uh, incidentally, my photograph was posted on the target of the Nassau Police Department pistol range. I'm told it improved their uh, shooting considerably. <laughs> Throughout all of those years, there was indeed a steady drumbeat of very powerful forces within Newsday, Liz alluded to some of them, and without, constantly demanded that I be fired forthwith. Forces such as Mayor Ed Koch, at the height of his powers, Long Island politicians, I won't name them, some top advertisers, I won't name them, two Newsday publishers, and a half dozen Newsday editors. The Long Island Business Association, Donald Trump tried to get me fired in 1991. I won't go into that. We've heard enough of Trump already. The State of Israel tried to get me removed. The New York Police Department, the PBA, the New York Fire Department, Peter Bother and his apartheid South African government, as Liz uh, told you about, and even the president of 50 major Jewish organizations. Journalism is not for the faint of heart if you're going to practice it as it should be practiced. If you curry favor with Trump or Sanders or Hillary, you should find yourself another career. Murray Kempton used to say that you had gone too far as a reporter when you began to call your source by his or her first name. After puzzling over the question about why I had managed I didn't know. They would ask me these questions. Why was it? How could you stay there? And da, 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 at Newsday, that paper on Long Island. I went to the source and I asked Dave Lamenthal. I said, why did you not buckle to that enormous pressure demand in my head? Why indeed did you not fire me? I asked. Without missing a beat, Dave said, we all make mistakes. <laughs> in that institutional sense where management decides whether a journalist's potential is blunted or allowed to flourish, I and most journalists at Newsday owe just about everything, in my view, to the administration of Dave Lamenthal, Bill Moyers, and others. Now, I don't want to sound like a great beard harking back to some non-existent golden age, for just as Moyers, Lamenthal, and others managers came to the newsroom for my generation, Today's news managers must plot the course for the millenniums to learn and practice the Jeffersonian brand of disinterested, tough, fair-minded journalism so critical for the survival of democracy. There's a lot at stake here, folks. This Republican is in trouble. The golden age of journalism, I would tell to the young and the old assembled here, is just ahead of us. Thank you.